Welcome back, everybody. I, I'm looking through the uh, participant list here, and I see a lot of familiar names, people that I know have been here for the entire series. So welcome back to you folks. Uh, probably some new names there, too. And so welcome uh, to everyone who this is your first webinar with us and with Dr. Jones. Uh, good news is the first three are all recorded. They're available in our YouTube channel. And they're already wildly popular. I know I looked last week, and the first one I think already had 7,000 views, and the second one, which had only been out there for a week, had 5,000 views. So uh, we're definitely getting a lot of uh, attention on YouTube with, with uh, this series, and I think we will continue to do so. Uh, tonight, as Noah said, wraps up the series. Uh, Dr. Jones is going to be talking about cover crops and soil health, but how how it fits particularly with vineyards and orchards. And I, I don't know, Noah and Dale, you know, some of the responses you get from some of our customers. I would say this is maybe one of the fastest growing areas of interest that we get calls on. We just get calls all the time from people with orchards and vineyards. And they're not always huge, but, uh, you know, they're, they're very high dollar uh, acres. And so I've enjoyed working with some of those. In fact, we've had so much interest that I have um, <clears throat> I have designated Davis, one of our sales guys here, uh, a sharp young man. Uh, he is going to become our orchards and vineyards expert uh, with cover crops. And in fact, he's leaving Sunday to go on a week-long trip to California, and he's going to be visiting a lot of our orchard and vineyard customers <clears throat> because the cover crops are all in all of their glory out there in California right now. So he's going to be taking some tours and learning all about that, learning how we can, you know, you know, maybe we need to go find some new uh, species to, to, you know, add additional diversity in those settings. And so I'm really looking forward to it. And even if you don't have any trees or any grapevines, you know, the, the concepts are the same, you know, so what Dr. Jones is talking about here. Uh, they may, she may be directing it specifically to these uh, settings, but the principles so listen for the principles because those principles will work regardless of what crop that you're growing. So uh, with that, I am going to shut up and go dark and uh, turn it over to you, Christine. Thank you very much, Keith. And thank you, Noah. And um, great to see so many people back on the call again today. Uh, and thanks for that introduction, Keith, because it it's, um, really leads perfectly into what I was going to say. And that is, I'm just going to, we're going to have, the technology is going to work. Oh, you know what, Noah? I just got a sign that says host disabled participant screen yeah, sharing. Yeah, I just, I just got that change. See if you can do oh, it now. Okay. <laughs> no, I was just in the middle of saying. <laughs> you were just saying it was going to be perfect. It's going to go perfectly today. Well, now that we've just got over that little glitch, everything else is going to go perfectly. We've got all the problems out of the way right at the beginning, so everything from now on is going to be perfect. Um, so I'm talking about um, cover, cover crops for carbon capture in orchards and vineyards. And just to recap very quickly on what we have spoken about in the last three um, webinars, I've talked about the importance of year-long green diverse ground cover. You're probably all sick of me talking about that, but I mean, that's, that's a mantra. Everyone has to learn that off by heart, year-long green diverse ground cover is vitally important for soil health. And that all comes down to um, the fact that optimizing photosynthesis, so if we have green plants that are photosynthesizing, they're going to be converting carbon dioxide to liquid carbon. And that basically keeps the fungal energy channel open. And we've spoken about the fungal energy channel in previous webinars. And uh, for some people, that was a new term. But basically the liquid carbon pathway and the fungal energy channel are the same, one and the same, because the carbon that's generated uh, through photosynthesis is going to move around in the plant sap as a liquid. Um, and some of that's going to be channeled down to the roots. And when it moves out into the soil ecosystem, it's going to go out through uh, either symbiotic fungi like, um, like mycorrhiza, or we're now recognizing, and the, the scientists said, look, at what's going on in the rhizosphere and what's going on generally in the soil are recognizing that there's a lot of what we call saprotrophic fungi um, that are also involved in moving that energy from the plant out into um, 
into the soil ecosystem, or as I called it in the first in the first webinar, the soil sachio biome, because it's a very, um, very, very social <laughs> um, community, and we have to understand how the different components of that community actually work together. There's a lot of cooperation goes on in the soil. And I think the other thing that's a little different now in terms of our understanding of what happens in the soil is that at one time it was thought to be a very competitive environment. There certainly is a lot of competition goes on too, um, but cooperation is more important than competition in the sociobiome. And um, what we have spoken about in previous webinars is how the plant associated soil fungal network. So as I said, those plant associated fungi may be just saprotrophs and they may be feeding on just uh, very simple carbon compounds like sugars coming out of plant roots. And this is a different approach to what's been considered in the past where fungi have thought to be decomposers of um, material that's got a high carbon to nitrogen ratio like you know wood chips or something like that. Now there definitely are fungi that are decomposers and the kinds of fungi that you might find in a forest ecosystem for example if you just scrape away some of the, um, the leaf litter on the surface will be decomposer fungi but also in that forest eco ecosystem there will be a mycorrhizal fungi that will be connecting all of those trees. And we're seeing that in our croplands and also in our orchards and our vineyards that mycorrhizal fungi are incredibly important. In fact, in vineyards, for example, uh, grapevines are highly mycorrhizal and it's really important that we support that network there. And as I said before, the saprotrophs. Now, what we've spoken about in previous um, days that I'm not going to repeat again, except for just now, is that that fungal energy channel is actually taking that energy which is starts as, as light energy that's transformed to biochemical energy through photosynthesis and it's uh, activating colonies of bacteria and archaea and these bacteria and archaea are able to produce the enzymes that we need to solubilize phosphorus and also the enzymes that we need to uh, fix atmospheric nitrogen and provided we can energize that sociobiome and keep that fungal energy channel open, we don't need to add um, any phosphorus or any nitrogen. In fact, adding those things is detrimental as I have um, described in the previous two webinars. So those factors that we've spoken about previously, they apply not only to cropland, but also to orchards and vineyards. And as Keith just mentioned, there's an increasing amount of interest in horticultural areas in diverse ground cover and for very good reason is because a lot of those uh, in those situations have had bare ground up till now. But at one time flowers grew naturally everywhere and I think I've mentioned this before about the prairies being you know 500 to 700 species and probably about 90 percent of those species were actually flowers with about 10 percent of them being grasses even though we think of it as grasslands. And this is um, a painting that Vincent van Gogh um, produced back in springtime in 1888 in France and he was just looking at the <laughs> at the plum trees that were flowering in this orchard it's called flowering plum trees or orchard in blossom um, but look at the ground cover and I've seen so many paintings uh, from the 1800s whether they be paintings of you know prairies in the United States or meadows in the United Kingdom or orchards in Europe that have a floral understory. In other words, there were flowers everywhere. They were a natural part of the ecosystem and the ecosystem way back then functioned a lot better than it does now. And in some parts, we still will see um, this diverse ground cover in our orchards, which is great. So just to go back to what Keith was saying about there's been a lot of interest in people using multi-species covers in their uh, horticultural situations now. That's because many of our current agricultural landscapes, it doesn't matter whether we're talking about row crops or vegetable production or fruit and nut trees, vines, et cetera, and home gardens, I see this often in home gardens, actually have a lack of that diverse year-long ground cover that we need or um, all the things that we talked about, about keeping that fungal energy channel open, about supporting the 
bacteria and the archaea that are able to produce enzymes that will solubilize phosphorus so that we don't have to add it and we'll be able to produce the enzymes that can fix the atmosphere uh, fix atmospheric nitrogen we talked uh, in the previous webinar about the fact that the atmosphere is 78 percent nitrogen which means in non-metrics terms there's something like 70 million pounds of nitrogen sitting above every acre of land so all we really need to do is activate the microbes that are able to fix that and diverse year-long ground cover is going to be the answer um, to doing that. So what happens when we do have um, horticultural situations, whether it be vegetables or whether it be tree crops or whether it be vines or even in people's backyard vegetable gardens, uh, if the interrow is bare, then the soil will deteriorate and this is going to have a negative impact on the health of the trees or vines or vegetables or whatever it might be. And it's also going to have a negative impact on uh, soil carbon because the title for today's webinar was uh, carbon capture in vineyards and orchards. So bare soil is always going to lose carbon. So what do we see in many of our vineyards? This is actually a photo from California um, so I'm pleased to know that there's going to be more and more people planting diverse covers in the interrows in Californian vineyards, but most of them have soil that's bare like that, and that is going to be losing carbon. If we look closely at the soil that's been ploughed up in this particular vineyard, you can see that it's coming up in great big lumps like bricks, um, which means that it's you know, severely lacking in soil structure. And again, here under the trees, you can see, I mean, all of you who are familiar with soils will know that when the soil comes up like that, it's not breaking up into small aggregates. So the points that have been made in previous seminars or webinars, the first one was basically that plant root exudates are the starting point for soil carbon. The old soil food web model was that we needed to add organic matter to soil that was going to decompose and that that would result in um, increases in soil carbon. To some extent that does happen, but it's a very, very small percentage. And because we were looking at that model, uh, a lot of scientists have said it's not possible to build soil carbon because they say we add all these tons of organic matter and at the end of the day, you've only increased soil carbon by a very small percentage. And that's because when it goes through that, what we call detrital, soil food web, it actually breaks down, breaks down, breaks down and ends up being carbon dioxide and goes back to the atmosphere. So if we want to build stable soil carbon, the first point is that it's going to be about plant root exudates. So we need photosynthesis and root exudation and we need to look at well, what are the factors that really promote that or optimise that. So they're going to be the starting point for most of our soil carbon. And in this photograph here, there was um, straw had been laid down on the surface. This is in a vineyard, which was great in a way. Like, I mean, there's lots of advantages to using a mulch. It was covering the, the surface and particularly in California, I guess, with those hot, dry summers, helping to keep some of the moisture in, um, buffering soil temperatures, all those kinds of things. Mulch is very, very beneficial for soil. But on the right-hand side, you can see some soil that was scraped up that was just underneath the mulch. And you can actually see there's a few pieces of, um, of straw there that are kind of incorporated into the soil and there'll be microbial activity going on, probably decompose a fungi um, because it's got a very high carbon to nitrogen ratio. And, that, and so the soil is sticking to that straw and there is a little bit of decomposition going on there's a little bit of activity but this soil over here that on the left hand side has been scraped up from just underneath the green leaves of these these plants here so that the root exudates even these are weeds but even in this situation the root exudates were producing darker soil uh, better aggregated soil and interestingly even though it was very hot and dry um, you think, well, if you have plants there, they'll be using soil moisture, but this soil was also a lot moister than the soil that was taken up from underneath quite a thick layer of mulch. This is a photo that was sent to me from the south of France. And I think another reason that we've tended to keep um, vineyards and orchards clear, in other words, to have the interrow bare, is because sometimes people would look at a photograph like that or look at a situation like that and think it looks untidy. I actually think it looks incredibly healthy. 
Um, and the person who sent me that photograph said, you know, his vines are amazing. He gets no pests and diseases. And basically uh, there's a whole heap of plantain there um, and, uh, and several grasses and some other, perhaps what people would call weeds. It's interesting that we always used to think of plantain or some people thought of plantain as a weed. And yet it's now it's regarded as a very highly valuable uh, pasture species because it has lots of secondary plant compounds that are very important for gut health in ruminant animals. So in this kind of a situation where um, he didn't have to plant anything, this is all just natural, but it, you know, and you could mow it from time to time to just to give you um, access into the into the orchard. It's all got there by itself. Probably doesn't have as many flowers as I'd like to see but a very healthy situation. But for some reason, in our simplistic way of thinking about things, we've thought that that is unhealthy when in fact that, that is healthy. So the second point, point number one, is that that kind of situation that we've just looked at is very important uh, for building soil. The second point is that plant diversity results in increased root exudation. So we, ne we need to have some plants any plants are going to produce root exudates, but if we have lots of different kinds of plants, we will get increased root exudation. So if we look at an area of land that's covered with just one thing, um, like say oats, for example, and compare that to the same soil, the same conditions, everything the same, but we have uh, a minimum of four functional groups in there or in um, probably easier to understand just four plant families in there, the science shows that there will be increased root exudation, significantly increased root exudation. And that's what we want um, for building soil carbon. So this is a lovely photo that I've used quite often. This is from the Rocky Farms in um, San Luis Valley in Colorado, um, just showing an, an example of uh, different plant families. We have Asteraceae and Brassicaceae and Boraginaceae in there that's easy to see, but um, it's also great for, uh, the, this is actually um, for, for pollinators and for also supporting uh, predatory insects that are going to be very beneficial for the crop. And it's aesthetically pleasing as well. And it is going to build more soil carbon. So point number one is we need root exudates. Point number two is that we need diversity to increase root exudation. And point number three, is it the microbial community? In other words, what kinds of microbes we have under our plants is actually a key factor in determining whether the soil carbon that we, we have um, accumulated there as a result of root exudates, what's going to happen to that carbon? Is that going to be respired as carbon dioxide or is it going to be stored in a stable form in the soil? And the microbial community in broad terms is going to be determined by the ratio of fungi <clears throat> to bacteria. So even though there's going to be thousands of species of microbes in there, we want it to be a fungally dominated community. And when it is fungally dominated, more of the carbon is going to be stabilized. If it's bacterially dominated, more of the carbon is going to be respired. And the key for having a fungally dominated community, again, is plant diversity, funnily enough. Why would that be the key to everything? <laughs> because that's how natural ecosystems work. As I mentioned right at the beginning, before I got a little bit sidetracked, um, you have 500 to 700 species, for example, in your prairies, as we did in our natural grasslands in Australia and as European meadows had, and most of those were flowers. So it's those plants, those broadleaf plants um, and a whole range of different species of broadleaf plants from different plant families are going to result in a um, fungally dominated soil and an open fungal energy channel. And that is the key factor for having the carbon that's come into the soil as root exudates to be stored as uh, stable carbon. And so they are soil building fungi. These are not our decomposer fungi. These are our soil building fungi uh, supported by plant diversity. So simple equation is more diversity, more fungi, more aggregates. And I may have shown you this photograph before. It's one of my favorites, but we just have soil particles here under high magnification. We can see the fungal hyphae 
pulling them together into little lumps. And when we have our aggregates, we have these beautiful pore spaces between the aggregates, which are so important for allowing the atmosphere to, uh, to come into the soil. Because if we want to have our free living nitrogen fixing bacteria and archaea operating in here, we want to have these uh, spaces where we can have that atmosphere that is 78% nitrogen down in there. If you've got compacted soil, it's all very well having 70 million pounds per acre of nitrogen sitting above your land, but it's not going to be able to get into the soil unless it's aggregated. So your plant diversity is going to be very important for um, supporting that fungal energy channel, for supporting aggregation and creating those pore spaces which are important for water and a whole lot of other reasons, but also important for our free living nitrogen fixing bacteria. Uh, so just to give an example from a cover crop, this is a photograph that Ian Gould in, uh, in England su supplied for the phosphorus paradox, which is an article in the um, Green Cover Soil Health Resource Guide, the seventh edition of that. Um, it's just such a beautiful photograph and Ian has very kindly uh, allowed me to use it in that article and also in today's webinar. The reason I love this photograph, not only is it very aesthetically pleasing, and I'm sure the bees love it as well, um, there hasn't been any nitrogen or any phosphorus fertiliser used for this cover. It has eight species and it has six plant families. And I think one of the keys to it being so effective in building soil, the farmer that had this cover on his land reported the best wheat crop ever after this cover. And I think the six plant families is, um, is, is one of the keys to that. So the other thing that we see from plant diversity in our covers is that it also increases resistance to pests and diseases. And that's the main, going to be the main focus of my talk today. Um, I think we all pretty much understand how carbon gets into soil. And I have talked about that before. Um, today, I want to talk about resistance to pests and, pests and diseases, and I'm going to use another one of Ian Gould's uh, photographs to begin with. This is um, what they call oil, uh, winter, winter oilseed rape in England, what we would call canola in Australia. And it has four, or, sorry, three, it has three companions. It has buckwheat, vetch, and phacelia. Oh, sorry, it has fenugreek buckwheat, vetch and phacelia. Yeah, okay, sorry, four companions. Um, did I get that right? It's got, well, I can see it's got buckwheat, vetch, phacelia and fenugreek. Yeah, oh, that's right. There's four plant families because fenugreek and vetch are in the same plant family. And then we've got the uh, oilseed rape, which is a brassica. So we have four plant families. And when I saw these photos, Ian sent me a whole heap of photos um, of this oilseed rape with all these companions in it. And I said, well, I guess, you know, there's going to be a yield loss because of all that competition, but I suppose it's improving the soil. So over time, it'll be a benefit. And he writes back and says, no, there's no yield loss. These crops with these companions are actually out yielding the monoculture canola and it's out yielding the monoculture can canola because having all those companions in there is actually providing resistance to, um, gosh, I think it's called the cabbage flea beetle or something that is decimating monoculture crops. And it doesn't seem to matter how much insecticide you lose, you, you can still, uh, how much insecticide you use, you can still lose a crop as many of you will know. So I think, then we have to ask the question, well, how is that happening? How come when we have all this plant diversity, we have this amazing resistance to pests and diseases? And how does that look in a horticultural situation? So I'm going to use citrus greening as a case study. Citrus greening and Ed James, there's an article written by Dale that's in the Soil Health Resource Guide and we were chatting about alligators just prior to this, uh, to the beginning of today's session. Maybe that's why, why we have so many problems with the, uh, <laughs> with, the <laughs> with the technology, but um, I will mention alligators in a moment. So citrus greening, also known as HLB, 
uh, has basically devastated the $9 billion citrus industry in Florida, which is pretty sad, but it was a recipe for disaster. It had a very long history of many pests and diseases in the citrus industry in Florida. Currently, there are around 500,000 acres of citrus monoculture. So when you look at it from the air, it's just citrus, 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 with virtually nothing else. It's very light, sandy soil. There's a lot of high analysis fertilizers used because of the fact that it is a light, sandy soil, although they would be unnecessary if that fungal energy channel was open. There's been cocktails of poisons used on, on citrus trees. In fact, if you knew what was being used on them, you probably wouldn't drink orange juice. And there is no plant diversity. So, I mean, it's an absolute setup for something to go wrong and lots of things have gone wrong. But look at the interrows. I mean, where, where, where is the diverse year long ground cover? It's not there. And if it wasn't going to be citrus greening, it would be something else. There is always going to be something will go wrong in a situation like that. So citrus greening or HLB is, um, it's a bacterium that's carried by the Asian citrus psyllid, which is a little insect. I'm going to show you a photograph of it in a minute. And the psyllid basically, um, when it, it's a sap sucking insect, and it's probably a bit like, uh, say, malaria being vectored by a mosquito, although malaria is not a bacterium, it's a parasite. But, you know, the mosquito will bite somebody who has malaria and then go and bite somebody else and carry the malaria from one person to the other. So when the psyllis, um, psyllid Asian citrus psyllid <laughs> sucks the sap, that's interesting, Asian citrus psyllid sucks the sap from a citrus tree <laughs> and then goes and sucks the sap from another citrus tree, it's going to carry the bacterium from one tree to the other. And so it has spread through the entire, um, it, and through the entire citrus industry, I guess, uh, in Florida. And it causes tree decline and eventually death of the tree. So this is our little su uh, sap sucking psyllid, <laughs> our Asian citrus psyllid. It's quite a cute little thing, actually. Uh, and this is what citrus greening looks like. So the leaves go kind of yellow and crinkly. And because the, um, the tree gets all blocked up, the phloem gets blocked up, it's not functioning effectively. It can't actually get sugars to the, to the oranges. So the oranges just stay green and they never ripen. And um, you can't sell green oranges. So there's been millions of dollars spent on various treatments trying to overcome this problem. Worryingly, one of those was to use an antibiotic because it was a bacterium. It was considered, well, maybe we could use an antibiotic. It was a human grade antibiotic, ox oxytetracycline, was applied to over 480,000 acres of citrus trees in 2016. That didn't work. So it was reapplied in 2017 and 2018 and the EPA approved that. EPA is supposed to stand for Environmental Protection Agency, how a human grade antibiotic could be approved for use over 480,000 acres, you would have to wonder, especially when we have all this talk about antibiotic resistance. Um, trees have also been injected with insecticide and that hasn't worked. And genetic engineering is the latest thing that scientists are talking about. Well, we'll genetically engineer uh, a citrus tree that is immune to this bacterium. Well, all of these treatments, including the genetic engineering, have actually failed to control HLB and around 100% of the trees are now infected and the multi-billion dollar Florida, Florida citrus industry has been devastated. And I was looking last night at um, just reading some articles on the internet and even the latest information is still saying that there is no cure. But the problem is not the lack of chemicals, it's the problem is lack of plant diversity. And thankfully, our come to the, uh, our hero <laughs> uh, in this story is Ed James, 
who has been demonstrating that plant diversity can reverse citrus greening. And Ed came across that discovery by accident, as so happens with many of the discoveries that people make. And you can read more about that in the Soil Health Resource Guide. There's an alligator in the story as well. I'm not going to say any more about the alligator. You'll have to read it to find out where the Florida alligator comes in. But this is our hero, Ed, and he's holding a sun hemp plant there, upside down. Uh, so you can see his uh, orange trees in the background here and this fantastic cover crop that he has in the interrow. And again, um, you can get more information about how Ed manages these diverse cover crops, but he basically plants several in one year. So they're all annual. So he'll plant one, uh, it'll come to maturity like this, and then he'll roll it or flail mow it, he'll flail mow it, and um, a lot of it gets pushed in under the trees so that it's actually mulch under the trees as well, and then plant another crop over the top of that. So he's continuously keeping photosynthesis going, and there's continuous supply of root exudates. And then, of course, you also do have the organic matter that's coming from... Um, just from the plant material as well. So what has been discovered in this situation is that when we have re reintroduced diversity to this plant community, the really interesting thing about Ed's trees is that they are now productive, but they're still infected with HLB. That's the thing that I find fascinating. So the bacteria is still there. The, sap sucking Asian, psyllid, Asian citrus psyllids are still there. We're not killing the pest. We're not directly trying to kill the bacteria. We're just dealing with the problem with plant diversity. And the trees are still infected, but they're productive. That is key to this story. And now there's been quite a few scientists have become interested in what is actually going on when we have diverse understories in orchards. And they have found um, that plant diversity supports soil microbially, soil microbial diversity, surprise, surprise, and that that improves soil health. So there's some nice research articles available now. So we have our trees here. Um, and then in the inter row, we have our diversity of plants in the cover crop and the scientists are finding, surprise, surprise, that the roots are intermingled and that there also, um, there's increased microbial abundance, there's increased microbial diversity, and that's all been measured, but it couldn't possibly not happen. And they're finding that there's increased nitrogen, there's increased um, carbon in this system and there's increased phosphoring, uh, increased cycling of phosphorus. So all the same things that we see when we use a diverse cover crop in our arable land, we are seeing the same things in vineyards and in orchards, that it works the same way. And now there's, we're getting some science around that. Um, <clears throat> the title of this article is The Impact of Cover Crops on the Soil Microbiome of Tree Crops. Great. So time and again, it doesn't matter whether we're talking about a walnut grove in California or a vineyard in California or a citrus grove in Florida, we're seeing that diverse plant communities exhibit far greater resilience to stress, like say drought stress, for example, and far greater resistance to pests and diseases. So question then is, well, how, exactly how does that work? Okay, we have more microbes there and we have more microbial diversity if we have diverse ground cover, but so what? How can just because we have more microbes in the soil and just because we have more microbial diversity, how can that make a tree that still has a bacterium in it that for most trees is actually causing the death of that tree now suddenly that tree can be productive. Same tree, still got the same issue, but now all of a sudden it's productive instead of dying. The answer to that is that 
all plants, including the plants that we have put uh, into the into the interrow, and our um, our grapevines or our citrus trees or our walnut trees or whatever it may be, all plants are multi-storey microbe apartments. In other words, there are more microbial cells within plants than there are plant cells. So if we look at plant leaves or plant stems or plant roots, under high magnification, we will see that they are full of microbial cells. And those of you who saw James White's uh, presentation on the rhizophagy cycle, we'll see that he shows some fantastic photographs, um, really like high magnification photographs of plant cells with all these little bacteria moving around in them. And it's not just bacteria that we're going to find in plants, we're also going to find archaea and fungi, plant associated fungi and plant associated bacteria and archaea. And that's a great thing because these microbes are capable of performing many amazing tasks, including protecting our plants from pests and diseases. So we've talked in previous times about the rhizosphere, which is the area around plant roots. We've talked about the phyllosphere, which is the area around plant leaves. And that maybe, you know, there's things that you could apply as foliars, like fish hydrolysate. Just while I'm mentioning that, I've had heaps of emails from people saying that they applied fish hydrolysate in strips to see what would happen and the strips greened up very quickly and BRICS tests showed that uh, BRICS, a refractometer showed that the BRICS levels were much higher. So there's been <laughs> lots of audience satisfaction, if you like, about using fish hydrolysate. So, we've, so that's the philosphere. So the endosphere is what is inside the plant and bacteria and archaea, fungi that live inside plants, we call them endophytes. But the endophytes come from two places. One is the core microbiome, which is the microbes that are in the seed of the plant. And we did mention the core microbiome in previous webinars. And the important thing about that is that research is now showing that some of our modern day varieties of crops, for example, um, don't have the same core microbiome. They don't have as many different kinds of microbes or abundance of microbes in the seeds as older varieties. And my understanding of that is that it's not so much the variety that's the problem. It's the fact that those plants have been bred <clears throat> and selected under high fertilizer conditions. So we've used lots of nitrogen, lots of phosphorus, and the plants are no longer communicating with the soil microbes, no longer taking up endophytes or no longer taking up microbes from the soil and supporting them as endophytes within the plant. So they can't get into the seed. So what we need to have happening in the soil, if we wanna have a good core microbiome for our seeds so that we will have healthy plants is we need to have biological induction taking place in the soil. You won't probably find that on a Google search because it's my term. But the core microbiome of the seed is dependent on the species, it's dependent on the cultivar. As I said, some modern cultivars of our commonly grown crops like corn and wheat and those kinds of things have very dysfunctional core microbiomes, um, whereas older cultivars have better ones. And it's a specific assembly of bacteria, archaea, there's protists in there as well, and fungi. So the microbes that are in that seed form a relationship with newly um, germinating plants. So we put the seed into the soil, we apply moisture or it rains or something, and the seed imbibes that moisture. A whole lot of enzymatic processes take place within the soil, within the seed, and it starts to germinate. And that is when the seed starts to communicate with the microbes around it, the microbes within it, and if it has a good core microbiome, it will um, form a relationship with, well, it, if it has a healthy microbiome, those microbes will actually emerge from the seed as it is germinating and enable that seed to obtain many of the nutrients that it needs. It, they will also, 
um, communicate with free living microbes. And if the plant needs more microbes, it will take those microbes up, um, internalize them, as James White would say, and they will remain in the plant for the duration of the plant's life. So let's just look at this from the point of view of, the, of a citrus tree, for example. So it has HLB, it's dying, it's, there are bare interrows, there is no microbial diversity for that plant to call on to help it. And plants will call for help. Um, they will send out signals through the roots and look for microbes that can help them. But if those microbes aren't there because we don't have the plant diversity there, then they call for help and their call is not answered. Now we have a diverse cover in the interrow. We have lots of different kinds of plants growing there from different plant families, lots of different kinds of microbes there. And they're all connected as that photo showed, uh, the diagram showed before, we've got the tree roots coming in under the interrow and they're going to be mingling with the roots of our cover crops. And so when those trees actually send out a signal from their roots to call for help, there are microbes that are going to be associated with our cover crop that are able to help them. And they can be internalized through this process of biological induction. They can be taken up into that plant and those microbes will help the plant deal with that bacterial infection, if that makes any sense. So those um, free living microbes that can be internalized by plants are also significant for nitrogen fixing. They can live within the plant, be supported by the plant and fix nitrogen. So you don't have to have nodules on plants to fix nitrogen. Every plant is able to support endophytes that it takes up from the soil and important for plant protection, as I just mentioned with the diseases and important for plant fitness for all of those reasons. But as I just mentioned, they, plants can't internalize those microbes if they're not there in the first place. And so how do we create a soil environment with a wide diversity of microbes? Well, you know the answer to that. We have to have a wide diversity of plants. I think it's a no brainer really. But I, I guess the thing is that until recently, we actually didn't know why diversity worked, why it was that a diverse cover crop, for example, in the interrow is going to be more effective than just a cover crop of one thing, say a cover crop of mustard or a cover crop of oats or something like that is not going to give you as much benefit as, ha as having your four plant families or a minimum of four plant families there. So plant diversity, as well as having ground cover and as well as having photosynthesis and as well as having something green, plant diversity is going to significantly stimulate biological induction. In other words, plant diversity going to stimulate soil building, it's going to stimulate nitrogen fixing, it's going to stimulate solubilization of phosphorus, it's going to stimulate the uptake of trace elements, minerals and trace elements, you know, other things like calcium, magnesium, you know, sulfur, boron, cobalt, molybdenum, and all those things that plant needs. And it's also going to stimulate biological induction, which is the taking up of what were free living soil microbes, which now become endophytes, and only if the plant needs them, it's not going to take those things out. A plant that's perfectly healthy um, is not going to take microbes from the soil that it needs to help it fight disease because it's not in the situation where, it's, um, where it needs them. So these diverse systems are self-organising. The microbes know what to do. The plants know what to do. We just have to create an environment where all of that can happen. We don't even really need to know how it happens. So if we have above ground diversity, we will have below ground diversity and all the details will take care of themselves. There's plenty of science around it now. Um, if anyone wants to read, I mean, obviously, if you read articles about the holobiont, if you read about vertical transmission, vertical transmission is just... Uh, the core microbiome and how that's inherited from one generation to the other, all those kinds of things, um, all those kinds of keywords are going to find you lots of articles. If for some reason, you know, Noah would like me to give you some articles to look at, we can attach them to the, to the YouTube video. Um, but really, 
if you get the diversity there and get year-long year green, so in, a, in an orchard or a vineyard situation, as Ed James has done, you may just have to have a series of annual covers that you just keep, you grow them, um, you terminate them in some way, you grow them again, you terminate them in some way, you grow them. And there's going to be lots and lots of approaches to that. Some people might even turn them in mechanically um, because they don't particularly want to use something like glyphosate or they might roll them, um, flail mow them. I mean, there are so many different approaches to this. And obviously, depending on which part of the world you are and what time of year it is, it's going to be different species. But remember that you want to have diversity in that mix. So just to summarise that, plant diversity is going to restore topsoil through um, building soil carbon, and that's going to produce aggregation and give us good structure, which is going to be so important for air and water and getting nitrogen, oxygen, all those things into the soil. It is going to completely replace fertiliser, unless, as I said, and I have said in previous webinars, you do need to do leaf tests or tissue tests and just to make sure that there isn't some essential trace element that's missing. And by all means, if something is not showing up in a leaf test, then do apply it. Um, most of them can be applied as foliars. Some of them will need to be soil applied, but mostly a foliar is going to be more effective and cheaper for you to do that. Um, insecticides become obsolete. And I've, I think I've said that before. There are farmers who have not used an insecticide for 10 or 15 years. They are, if, if you have insect pests, it's a symptom of low diversity. Again, if you have fungal pests, it's a symptom of low diversity. So fungicide becomes redundant, um, but definitely will support beneficial insects, displaces weeds. If we have, you know, a very vigorous um, ground cover of lots of different kinds of plants, our weeds become irrelevant largely, um, and it improves landscape function. And what I mean by landscape function is basically how water moves through the landscape. So there's going to be droughts become less severe, floods become less severe, um, the whole water cycle functions much more effectively. And this could apply even to your a little backyard home garden. <laughs> um, doesn't even necessarily have to be a big vineyard or a big orchard. Uh, you can grow your vegetables in mixes. Interestingly, this sweet alyssum here is in the Brassicaceae family. It's a brassica. Many people don't realise that. Um, but all these things are edible as well. You can eat the flowers, everything in the Asteraceae family. Mind you, some of them are bitter, and uh, I don't think I've ever tasted a daisy yet that I really particularly would have included in a salad, but they look pretty. Um, lettuces are in Asteraceae as well. You've got your alliums. You know, so just, just get a mix. It, it's visually appealing. Um, there's going to be lots of valuable vitamins and minerals here for people as well. And it's great for soil building. You'll build more soil with plant diversity than you will uh, just with a monoculture or something. And even just in your home gardens, just even if it's not something you're going to eat, <laughs> um, look after your trees by having a whole range of different kinds of flowers under trees. Trees and grasses do not get along. This tree is going to be much, much healthier with a diversity of flowers underneath it than it would be if it had grass underneath it and look after our pollinators. And there was this one more slide I was going to show you and that was um, this one of a refractometer. I've just had so many questions about how do you measure bricks and what's a refractometer, where do I get one? Just look it up on the net and you'll, you'll find, you know, how to measure bricks and there'll be tables of, of different bricks levels and everything, but basically, you're going to squeeze some sap out of the leaves of your plant using a garlic press or something. You're going to put that on this uh, plate here, put the slide cover down and you're going to look through it and it's just going to measure the refractive index of the sap. It's just to see how much light is refracted as it moves through that sap. And you want to have a really high refractive index, in other words, a high bricks level, because if there's lots of um, solid material in that um, in the sap, the, that material is going to be sugars, it's going to be minerals, it's going to be trace elements. Um, it's going to mean that the plant is nutrient dense 
and it's going to be much better for human consumption or animal consumption and it's also going to have much higher resistance to pests and diseases so you're um, using a spade to dig a hole have a look to see whether you have aggregates forming have a look to see whether you have rise sheaths on the roots of your plants and use a refractometer to measure bricks levels just to give you an idea like even if you were trying different things i mean there's been a lot of discussion about biostimulants and biological inoculants and there's a whole range of things that people can use, but you know, fish hydrolysate is something that I have mentioned several times because it, it's one way of transitioning off inorganic nitrogen as well because it's an organic nitrogen source. Um, but a few people who have tried it and emailed me back have said that one thing they really noticed in addition to the fact that their plants were greener was that their bricks levels went up. But you'll also see higher bricks levels when you have um, diverse Plant diversity will also give you higher brick levels. So I'm just going to stop sharing there now. We actually got to the end and we still got a little bit of time. What have we got? Half, still got half an hour, I think. Is that right? It was, it was perfect, yep. Um, <laughs> well, not, not perfect in that regard, but we made it through. <laughs> The information, and like I said, that's all that, that people really care about anyway. They don't care to look at my face, that's for sure. So we are going to kick things off here with the questions. Um, and we've got quite a few already in here. So um, I'm already kind of thinking we're not going to get to all of them this evening. But I do have a question here from Claire. She said, what are your thoughts on fungal diseases in orchards and vineyards uh, like mildews? cankers etc and claire i guess i'm looking for more insight on, on what you mean by like your thoughts is it just something where you're trying to treat those or I, i've read a couple questions that are kind of along those same lines of, of what to do with those fungal diseases uh yeah so when i was reading up about the um the citrus greening last night no, I, one of the things I noticed was the citrus industry in Florida has been plagued by diseases since, you know, 1960 or something. There's been a whole range of different diseases. Citrus greening has probably been the worst one because it has totally devastated the industry. But one of the other things that did come up was there were, were a lot of uh, what they call cankers, like different canker um, things that were affecting the trees. And again, I would just put it back to the fact there was just citrus, like just a monoculture of citrus, you've got no plant diversity, um, you don't have year-long green diverse ground cover. We've, we've had the same issues in our citrus orchards in Australia. We haven't had the citrus greening issue, but we've had lots and lots and lots of issues, not just with diseases, but also with, um, with insect pests like thrips and things like that. And they've all been cured by diverse ground cover. I know it sounds too simple, but, um, and the other thing is, if you're in a really humid environment, for example, and there are issues with, you know, like um, fungal pathogens on, the, on leaves, then that's often where something like a compost extract or a vermi liquid uh, sprayed onto leaves can have a, have a huge effect because you're just basically changing the microbial balance on the leaves. And that, that also works on grapes or it also works on... Um, you know, plants that are in the squash family, like pumpkins and zucchinis and things like that, you'll often notice mildew on the leaves of those when just getting towards the end of summer, coming into fall, that as the photosynthetic rate of the plants drop and the plant's immune system is not so effective, you'll start to see mildew on those leaves. What I find is really effective in my garden at home when I start to see that happening is I just spray milk on the leaves because that just supports a really healthy microbiome on the leaf surface and those microbes that grow in the milk, I guess, probably lactobacillus, are able to combat the mildew, provided you catch it early enough. So that's one thing you can do is, is, is use some kind of a biostimulant. The milk's a great one on the, on the leaves, but plant diversity will take you a long way as well. 
Kevin brings up kind of an interesting point. He said for the vineyard photos shown, there must be a reason why the growers prefer bare soil to dirt. Can you explain why? Maybe even provide, if, if you have any history of how we got to that point. Well, I think one of the things is that there's some kind of a, like almost a cultural thing where it was considered to be untidy. If you think of that photo from the south of France with all that plantain growing in the interrows, it'd be easy to look at that and think it was really poorly maintained. You think, oh, that farmer doesn't care about their, their land because they've just let all those weeds grow in the interrow. Um, and so we've, we've wanted it to be neat. We've wanted to just have one kind of plant there and nothing else. And I think it's been mostly cultural, really. It, it's been considered um, that, that you're not really looking after your land if you, if you have all those other plants growing there. I mean, even when cover crops that were first, I mean, I'm sure you all remember when cover crops, when people first started growing cover crops, their neighbours would often shun them and say it was so untidy to have all those different plants growing there on their land. Like, why didn't, why weren't they keeping it neat and tidy? Especially if you had something that was all different heights and um, <laughs> people would be saying it was, you know, it was introducing weeds or it was going to be a fire hazard or, you know, everything that people could think of it, because it, it's almost like a belief system that everything is supposed to be neat and tidy and you're just supposed to have whatever it is that you're growing, like your grapevines or your fruit trees or even your vegetables. Like look at all the bare ground that we see in vegetable production. I think it's just a cultural thing. Well, also I suppose in vegetable production, people are trying to keep weeds down. I mean, weeds really aren't an issue for, um, for tree production. You're better off with having plants under your trees than not having them there. Yeah, I think it's just this mindset we have, some people call it the mechanical mind that we, <laughs> that we want to just see things in neat rows and we want to see bare ground between the, between the rows. So you mentioned there in vegetable yeah. production that you know, they're trying to keep weeds down. Do you have any thoughts here? Maybe Keith or Dale can chime in as well on uh, best cover crops for vegetable production. Have you seen any of, any of those situations work well? Yeah, well, I guess probably when it comes to vegetables, you have a lot more experience than I would in those, but, you know, things like planting green, you know, rolling something down and planting into it is probably going to be the most, then you're getting the mulching as well. You know, crimping, crimping something down and planting, planting into that. I don't really know a great deal about, I've heard some really good podcasts. Jesse Frost did a great podcast recently with uh, John Kemp on organic no-till vegetable production and talked about all the different approaches, like you could have a really thick layer of compost would be one way of doing it, um, or a thick layer of straw would be another way of doing it, or you can solarize it by putting, you know, black plastic down and basically killing everything under the plastic, but that also has a detrimental effect on earthworms and soil microbes. And um, yeah, and as Keith, I see he's just put us, little note up there about Steve Groff has a lot of, yeah, that's something I don't really know a lot about, but there is a lot of information about that on the internet. I think if people go looking, they'll find that. Lots of different approaches really on that. Um, Albert yeah. says, do you see any merit in conventional soil tests? Seems like you and Dr. Rakani and others point to the tissue samples. Uh, is there any value in still taking a conventional soil test? It depends what you measure in the test. It's certainly valuable for carbon, provided you use um, the kind of, if, if you're actually looking at the total carbon that's there. It's also valuable for looking at total phosphorus if you just want to be sure to see that you've got, um, I had an email from uh, Willie Pretorius the other day from uh, Ward Laboratories telling me that they've been looking at total phosphorus levels and just about every soil they've sampled had something between 1,000 and 3,000 pounds per acre of phosphorus in it. So I think people will be quite surprised when they find out how much phosphorus they have in total. So their totals are going to be important and their total carbons are going to be important. Their total phosphorus is going to be important just as a reassurance that you'll know that you've got heaps there and total nitrogen. And I think it's very important to look to see 
if you want to know, um, if, if, if there was something you wanted to know about your soil, I mean, how much of the nitrogen is actually in the organic form and how much of it is in the form of nitrate or ammonium? And what, we'll see, what you'll see is that in a healthy soil, the nitrogen, you could have a really high total nitrogen level, um, but virtually none in what's called an available form. So your nitrates will be low, your ammoniums will be low. And if you do have any inorganic nitrogen in the soil, you want it to be in the ammonium form, not in the nitrate form, because the problem with it being as nitrate is that it's going to be very readily leached. And if you irrigate or if there's heavy rain, it's just going to leach through the soil profile. It's going to be lost. It's going to go through to groundwater. Um, and as you've seen, like, you know, in the Ogallala aquifer, you'll have really high nitrate concentrations now in the groundwater. It gets to the point where it's, you know, dangerously high for human consumption, just because what's happened is that the nitrogen that's in the soil has been in the inorganic form, which means that it's readily leachable. But I mean, you know, that's that's of interest to some people. It may not necessarily be of interest to everyone. If you, if you wanted to know, they'd be the sorts of things that you'd be looking for. But there's other things that aren't really going to show up. Like, you know, like things like if there's an iron deficiency or a zinc deficiency or something, it may not show up on a soil test because those things are actually going to be in your soil. It's just that they're not plant available. So the fact that it's showing up on a soil test is not all that helpful. You might still see that you have symptoms in your leaves. So you really need to do leaf tests to find out, you know, what's going on in your leaves. And then there's things like, say, calcium, for example. A lot of our soils in Australia are based on limestone, which is calcium carbonate. So theoretically, the, you know, the parent material is calcium carbonate. They've been derived from, from that, from limestone. They have massive amounts of calcium in them, but when you do a soil test, we'll show there's virtually none available. And it's not available because it's not, the soils are not biologically active. And so the soil test is really misleading. In fact, calcium is the fourth most common element in soil after um, silicon, aluminum and iron. It's the fourth most common element in just about every soil in the world, and yet how many people come back saying that their soils that they're deficient in calcium? It's a bit like phosphorus. You know, an available phosphorus test will tell you that your soils are low in phosphorus and that you need to apply it, but a total phosphorus test will tell you you have thousands of pounds of phosphorus, and all you need to do is activate it. Have I confused you totally? <laughs> A soil test is useful if you actually understand what it is that you, you know, you need to know something about why you're taking a soil test and what are you looking at. You really need to look at your totals and you need to understand what they mean. Unfortunately, soil tests in the past have just looked at availables, looked at available N, looked at available phosphorus. They've only been very shallow, you know, only been like the top couple of inches of the soil. And the recommendation that will come back from the lab is you don't have enough nitrogen, you don't have enough phosphorus, you need to add it. And soil tests traditionally have been taken as the basis for a fertilizer recommendation. And the recommendation that's invariably come back is that you need to add something. So if we look at soil tests in a different way and say, well, we, we actually do want to know what's in our soil. We want to know what our total phosphorus is. We want to know what our total nitrogen is. We want to know what our total calcium is, just so that we're reassured that those things are actually there. And then we should probably do a leaf test just to make sure that the trace elements are getting into our plants. So yes, they can be valuable. I wouldn't write them off completely, but they have been very misleading in the past. And they've probably been the reason that people have applied so much nitrogen and so much phosphorus to soils has been because a soil tester says there's not very much available. And, and farmers have thought when that, you know, for example, phosphorus, if it's only showing there's a few parts per million of phosphorus on a soil test, farmers have mistakenly believed that that's all they had. Or they've mistakenly believed that what's gone out the farm gate in product has depleted the amount of phosphorus that's in their soil. It's like saying if you take nitrogen out of the air that you're depleting the amount that's there, you know. <laughs> or if you take salt out of the sea that you're depleting the amount that's there because you, you can't deplete it. 
it, it would take you know thousands and thousands of years to deplete it. Okay, um, Raul asks uh, kind of more of your opinion here. So if you don't want to share, that's fine. But your opinion that microbes are living chemicals, it's something that um, I know I've heard maybe only once or twice before. And then the possibility that the archaea bacteria has the capacity to degrade single use plastics. Well, every living thing is made of chemicals. I mean, we're made of chemicals too. So I'm, I'm not really sure what he's referring to. I obviously haven't read the same article or I'm not, not aware of that research. In terms of degrading um, complex structures like plastics, bacteria and archaea have amazing capabilities to do that. I wouldn't be the least bit surprised that they can degrade plastics. I mean, they're often used to clean up contamination. You know, if there's been an oil spill or something like that, uh, bacteria are fantastic for cleaning up those sorts of things. So it wouldn't surprise me. And you find bacteria in archaea in very, very inhospitable environments, you know, like in, um, uh, like under the ocean, there's what they call these deep ocean vents that have um, like magma spewing up out of the earth's crust, at, you know, thousands of degrees or something and you'll actually find bacteria and archaea living in those very very hostile environments they seem to be able to to live almost anywhere and at one point archaea were considered to, to be uh, some specialized kind of bacteria that was able to withstand very extremes I think they were called extremophiles because that's where archaea were first isolated in these very extreme environments but then we discovered that actually archaea are very common. We just didn't have the way, didn't have the technology for um, assessing archaea at one stage. Now we find that, you know, the human gut has hundreds of species of archaea. The rumen of a, you know, a cow has hundreds of species of archaea. There's hundreds of species of archaea in our soils. They're very, very common. But at one time they were considered to be extremophiles. So, I mean, and there are some microbes that live in the soil that don't utilize light energy in other words they're, they're not living on that fungal energy channel they're not using root exudates for energy there are um, you know microbes in the soil can be called autotrophs and they're the ones that are able to photosynthesize themselves like blue green algae um, cyanobacteria you know they, they can photosynthesize they don't have to depend on a plant and then there's the heterotrophs, which are the ones that do depend on plants or they do depend on decomposing organic matter. And then there's the chemotrophs. You know, there are bacteria that can live on sulfur or something they, and they're just going to um, just change its oxidation state and use the energy that comes from um, reducing or oxidizing a chemical. So they're called chemotrophs. Um, so yeah, it can get very complicated complex, but all microbes are going to be composed of chemicals, so I'm not really sure, as all living things are going to be composed of chemicals. Okay, I'm reading a, a question on Facebook here. Is it safe to say that having green plants in the inter row will increase soil moisture, or is there a risk of drying out the soil with certain cover crops? So in the short term, it's quite possible, I suppose, that if you have a really dysfunctional soil and you add extra plants in there, obviously they're going to photosynthesize and use, use some moisture that's there. But what happens is that as they build soil, once they actually get those aggregates forming and it doesn't really take that long, if you have a diversity of plants and you don't put high analysis fertilizer on them, it doesn't take long. They're going to form riser sheets. They're going to start aggregating the soil. And once they actually form those aggregates, soil moisture that's inside an aggregate is going to be protected from evaporation. So very rapidly, you can change the whole water balance equation of the soil so that it holds more moisture. Because when you look at, a, at water balance, like how much water comes into the environment, how much goes out and how does it go out? How does it actually leave the soil? Does it leave via evaporation or does it leave via transpiration? And in actual fact, in most environments, particularly somewhere like California, for example, in summertime, most of it is going to leave as evaporation. And that's where people get really confused because in the past, 
evaporation and transpiration have been put into one term called evapotranspiration. And we've assumed that when you've got green plants there, that they're using up all the water in transpiration. In actual fact, when you have bare ground, you lose more as evaporation. So by having green plants there, yes, they will transpire some moisture, but if they're diverse and if you haven't used high analysis fertilizer, they are going to very rapidly build riser sheets and aggregates and that any water that's then added to that system is going to be held within those structures and they're going to conserve moisture. So you can change the whole water balance equation. And we've seen frequently seen in orchard and vineyard situations in Australia, for example, um, especially where people are using irrigation water so that they've had to um, pay for it. In our situation, people have to pay a lot for water. Um, they've been able to increase their water use efficiency. In other words, they've been able to reduce the amount of water that they've needed to use um, by something like 40%, which saves them a lot of money. And I think Brendan Rocky also says the same thing, that the reason that his potato production in Colorado has become more profitable is because he's now using diverse covers rotated with his potatoes and the covers are building the soil and he uses less water. So his water use efficiencies are where he's actually saving the money. So don't confuse transpiration with evaporation. The other thing about water that's transpired is depending on the environmental conditions, obviously on a windy day, this is not gonna happen. But under many conditions, we have what's called a short water cycle where water will be transpired and then overnight will return back to the, to the soil as, um, as dew or as a fog or something like that. And time again, I've been, um, I've never seen it myself, but I've been told by farmers in Western Australia, which is very light soils, uh, very hot, dry environment, low rainfall, that where people have planted perennials, perennial pastures, and they'll often just plant a small area to start with, like um, 20 hectares, which is like say 50 acres or something, but this will be on a big ranch. So they'll, they'll have thousands of acres and they'll just, 50 acres will be a small area compared to the rest of it. And they'll plant like just a square of perennial grasses. Um, now they're putting more things in besides the grasses, but originally it was just like several species of perennial grass. And they'd say first thing in the morning, just as the sun was coming up, you go out and look and there would be a square of fog. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like mist, just sitting, just like a perfect square, sitting directly above those plants and nowhere else. And then when you went and looked at the grasses, the, the leaves were all wet. So in other words, what's happening is it's creating its own micro environment. And a lot of that moisture is actually returning back to the plant. So yes, they did transpire it, but it's a short, what we call a short water cycle. It can return back as dew or fog. And that's the sort of thing that people don't take into account. If you've got bare soil, it is going to lose moisture. It is going to go downhill and lose aggregation. It's going to become more and more uh, blocky in structure. It's going to become more and more compacted. So even when it does rain or even when you do irrigate, moisture can't even get in there. So you, when you look at the complete water balance equation, infiltration is going to be the first thing. And if you haven't got aggregated soil, how can the water infiltrate? And then you need it to be, uh, you need to have the kind of soil structure where it can be stored and be protected from evaporation. The other thing about having a diverse cover there is that if you've got deep roots under those plants or any kind of roots really compared to having bare ground, bare ground's got no roots in it, the water will follow those root channels down. So when you do irrigate or when it does drain, the water is going to penetrate much more deeply into those soils. So even being deeper in the soil profile is going to protect it from evaporation. You really just want to change the logistics of the whole thing so that more infiltrates, less evaporates, and anything that transpires is actually going to make you money. Transpiration makes money, evaporation loses money. So it's, uh, I, you know, when people go, oh, if we put cover plant, if we, if we have a cover in the interrow, it's going to use water. It's really not based on science. It's just a, a human belief that that's what's going to happen. Okay. 
Uh, Shorty says, when I'm seeding a multi-species cover crop, I want to use a vermiliquid on the seed. How long after that vermiliquid is applied would the autoinducers in the vermiliquid be effective? Okay, so that's a great question. I wasn't sure whether to talk about biostimulants today or not, and I thought we'll get really bogged down in biostimulants, so I didn't mention them because I, how many emails have I had about biostimulants? Hundreds of them. Uh, so it's a great question, Shorty. So the thing is that biostimulants, if it's Fermi liquid that we're talking about, we're talking about the chemical signaling molecules that microbes use <coughs> to communicate with each other, and these are called autoinducers. Now, if you look at the structure of an autoinducer, and I did think about putting some pictures in my presentation, but I decided not to, but they're all based on what's called a carbon ring. In other words, there are six carbon atoms. Um, it's called a benzene ring. I don't know why we call it a ring when it's actually a hexagon, um, but there are six carbon atoms uh, forming a hexagon. And then there's other side chains coming off that, but all autoinducers actually have that basic what we call a ring structure, which is very stable. So once these signaling molecules that bacteria and archaea and fungi, all living things actually produce to signal to each other are very stable molecules. But because they need to survive in that soil sociobiome, they need to go from one microbe to another and another one needs to be able to recognize that signal. So if it was broken down easily, it's not going to be transmitted but it can be broken down by microbial activity. So the question Shorty asked was, if I put autoinducers for the vermi liquid, for example, onto the seed, how long will they last? Well, the answer is that if it was dry, if you had some way of drying the seed, they're probably going to last for, I don't know, six to eight weeks maybe. But if the seed is still wet, which means that microbial activity can take place, they're not going to last very long at all. And you'd need to get that seed straight into the ground. In some situations where people are planting dry, what we call planting dry in Australia, so that if, if we're in an environment where we don't get very frequent rain, sometimes farmers will plant a crop dry and just have it in place waiting for it to, to rain. And so the soil will be dry, you'll be putting, um, auto induces on the seed and then putting the seed into dry soil so the seed isn't going to germinate until it rains. In that situation, it can sit there for six weeks and still be um, effective. So that you could, let's say you could plant for a whole six weeks up to when it rained and the seed that you put in the ground the day before it rained is going to grow just as well as seed that you put in the ground six weeks before. That's what we're seeing. But if the, if the soil was wet or if the seed was wet, then you're going to have microbial activity um, and it, it is going to break down those, decompose those autoinducers. So the salient point is if it's dry or if there's no microbial activity, it will last for several weeks. If there is microbial activity, it's not going to last very long at all. And the other thing is you don't want to have wet seed lying around because it's going to get mouldy. So if you have some way of drying it, that's fine. If you can't dry it, you actually need to plant it the day that you apply the autoinducers. Okay, I'm gonna ask this question kind of selfishly because there's a plug here. Um, Willie asks, what are your thoughts on the chaos garden cropping for vegetables where all the different summer veggies are planted in a mix, hence the word chaos. Have you done any kind of research, any studies um, on the MILPA program, anything like that? No, I haven't done any studies on it, no, but I think it's fantastic. <laughs> I really, really love that whole idea of the MILPA gardens and I love the, you know, the community involvement aspect of it as well. And I promote MILPA gardens to everybody I talk to, even though in other countries we haven't got access to your milpa seed mix just saying you know look just get a whole lot of vegetables a whole lot of flowers throw them in together um, it's probably you know your harvest efficiency if you like your harvest index is not going to be all that high because it's going to be a lot of wastage in there or what we would think of as wastage in terms of vegetables because not everything is going to get picked and not everything is going to get used but there has been no time involved in you know cultivating soil applying any fertilizers you know weeding and um, 
uh, I, I think there's huge advantages. I would really like to see, you know, much wider use of that technique in just commercial vegetable production. I don't really see why. I, I mean, and, and as Gay Brown has done in the past, you can just come in and graze the whole thing after it's been, you know, you've picked your vegetables out of it and you get really high live weight gains in livestock because there's so much diversity there and so much nutrition there, especially if you've put, you know, you've got some herbs and things in the mix. I mean, it's, I can't see any downsides to it at all. I think it's a great, it's a great technique. I'd, I'd love to see it adopted much more widely, really. I guess the problem is that most people who grow vegetables commercially have, you know, half an acre or something like that. And so they would see that as not an effective use of their land. But maybe if we just moved a little bit further away from urban areas and we converted some, you know, like where the Milpa Gardens have been used on, um, on, on ranches and things like that, it's not such a big issue. Like what's a, what's a couple of acres really? Throw in a Milpa Garden and it's going to build beautiful soil. It's going to be great for predatory insects. It's going to be great for pollinators. It's going to be great for the local community. <laughs> so, yeah. Again, you get 20 out of 10 for Milpa Gardens. <laughs> so if that's something you're interested in, uh, on our website, if you just search Milpa, or you can even go to milpagarden.com, um, what we're referring to is uh, our Milpa mix. We have, there's 40 different vegetable species in there, and we're willing to donate up to an acre's worth of seed if you are willing to donate up to 75% of the produce for that. So kind of a cool project it's not like we're the only ones um you know that are, are mixing vegetables together but we're really trying to promote that in building communities because that's kind of what food should be about so if that's something you're interested uh you can visit our website there i will wrap this up here with one possibly maybe two questions here um eric says do you know if a strip of plant diversity can have an effect on the culture on the side of it. And so I'm going to kind of add to that. Have you seen any effect on diversity next to a monoculture? How far of an effect does that have? Well, that would depend on how extensive the root systems were of the different plants. As been, What has been shown with the citrus orchards, for example, is because the trees actually have roots that run right in, in under the interrow when you plant a cover crop on top of that, the roots are able to mingle. So I would say that the effect will only last as far as either the roots can mingle or the mycorrhizal networks can extend. And yeah, so there's, it's probably in an annual crop, it's probably not going to be very far. You, you're probably, like with something like relay cropping uh, or interseeding or intercropping, you're definitely going to get that effect because you've got everything, you know, that it, it will extend, you know, 12 inches or so, or maybe even further. If, if it's mycorrhizal, it'll probably extend a little bit further than that, but it's not going to extend for, you know, 10, 20 feet sort of thing. In Because there's no way, you, you know, the roots either have to be in very close proximity or they need to have good mycorrhizal networks uh, um, like bringing them into contact with each other. And the problem is that in an annual situation, they're not really there, plants are not really there for long enough to form those really um, large mycorrhizal networks. In, a, in an orchard situation or in a vineyard, you should have, provided you're not using too many toxic chemicals, you should have a really good underlying common mycorrhizal network that you're interseeded or your um, your interrow cover crop can just just like plug into that just plug straight into like the grid really <laughs> the grid that's already there but you're not going to have that in an annual crop so it is going to be a little bit different in an annual crop where things are only you know active for a couple of months they're not going to be good microvital networks under there if that answers the question that, that not there, there can be good mycorrhizal networks in a high diversity cover crop within that crop itself, which is why you know we're seeing those great features like drought tolerance and everything. But it's not going to extend very far beyond that. That's what I'm saying because the plants aren't there for very long. 
So this last question, uh, it's, it's somewhat off topic, but I think it wraps up this series in a sense of why this all matters. Um, because, you know, we, we love plants, but at the end of the day, the reason we're trying to do this is for human health. Tatiana says, um, do you think that we as humans, when healthy, recruit particular types of microbes into our bodies through chemical signaling. So what kind of benefits is there for us and our food system through healthy soil? Oh, that's a, an interesting question. We obviously need healthy soil to have nutrient dense food, but just when we're looking at this from the human perspective, we also need to eat a wide diversity of foods as well as the foods that we eat we want them to be wholesome. We don't want them to have toxic chemicals on them. And we do want them to be nutrient dense. But in the same way that the soil requires a diversity of plants in order to have a diversity of microbes in order to function effectively as a whole, the human gut also requires a diversity of microbes in order to function effectively. And the only way that we can get a diversity of microbes in the human gut is to eat a wide diversity of plant foods, as well as whatever animal foods you like. I'm not saying you have to be vegetarian, but every kind of plant food that you eat is going to support different microbes in your gut in the same way that every kind of plant that grows in the soil supports different microbes. So the research from the American Gut Project shows that people, Americans who consumed 30 different kinds of plant foods in a week, at least 30 different kinds of plant foods, had virtually no autoimmune disorders. By autoimmune disorders, I mean things like heart disease, diabetes, whatever. I wouldn't be surprised to find it was also linked to immunity um, against things like COVID, for example, that we know that people ha who have a weaker immune response are more susceptible, that there are cofactors that go with COVID. Um, and one of those surely has got to be the integrity of the gut microbiome. So it's not only going to be what is the integrity of the foods that you're eating, but how many different kinds of plant foods are you eating? So if you would like me to send you a link to the American Gut Project, it was a citizen science project that involved more than 11,000 American citizens who participated in that project. And they found that people who eat, who ate 10 or less different kinds of plant foods in a week had very simplified gut systems or very simplified gut microbiomes and they had very poor immune response. They were more susceptible to just about everything that was going, probably including COVID, although at the time that that research was done, we hadn't heard of that at that stage. So I think it is very important for people um, just forgetting about soil for a minute, but for people just to eat a wide diversity of plants and also to make sure that those plants obviously are grown in healthy soils. The other thing too, is that um, if, if you're eating some green plants, in other words, you're not cooking them like herbs, like say parsley or cilantro or something like that, you can actually, the microbes that are endophytes that are within those plants can pass through your um, digestive juices in your stomach <clears throat> and can get down into your large intestine, which is where, which is where basically where your gut microbiome is and, um, and improve it, improve the diversity of it. So eating some, some green things that have actually got microbes in them. So, you know, an iceberg lettuce grown with lots of nitrogen and phosphorus is probably not going to help you a lot. <laughs> but if you had some, some nice herbs that were grown in your own backyard in biologically active soils, they can definitely improve the function of your human gut microbiome. And the thing about that is that the microbes that are in the human gut are able to switch genes on and off in our bodies. That's where it gets really powerful. So they can switch our genes on for immunity, or if we don't have sufficient diversity in our diet and we don't have the microbes there, then the genes that we need for immunity won't get switched on. In fact, that's a good question because um, my brain is now just connecting the dots and it's probably almost exactly the same as what's happening with citrus greening. In Ed James's a citrus grove, for example, he has a diversity of plants there, which means there's a diversity of microbes there, which means his citrus trees are able to access those microbes 
and utilize them for immunity. If there was no ground cover there, there are no microbes that they can call on when they need them. So if we eat uh, a diversity of plant foods and we have a diversity of microbes in our gut, when we need them for something, because at least 80% of our immunity comes from our gut, some people say even higher, but it's a minimum of 80% of human immunity comes from your gut microbiome. If you have a diverse gut microbiome, and if those microbes are able to switch genes on to help you, like actually switch human genes on to help you fight disease, it's really, really important. So that, that's a very good point, I think, to end the series on, because after all, it is about food production, isn't it? We're, we're, we're growing, well, hopefully growing most of them for, for food production. I know some of it goes into ethanol, but uh, especially when we're talking about um, orchards and vineyards, we're talking about food production. So even yeah. just having, you know, a diverse interrow in an orchard or a vineyard is going to improve the quality of the fruit or the nuts that are produced in that situation or the vegetables that's a case maybe. And Stephen makes a good point talking about the grazing animals that graze on diverse pastures are also full of you know those same nutrients so even the meat that you're eating as well and so i think that's, that's a good thing very to, true. Yeah. to and point also, out yeah also more um like the essential amino acids are going to be in the right kind of you know omega-3 rather than omega-6 there'll be much more omega-3 in that meat if animals are grazing on pastures diverse pastures for sure it's going to be yeah. much healthier for it and the milk and the butter <laughs>